Hi, I'm Giles Martin. I'm here in Abbey Road Studio 2. I was actually born in 1969 um, on John Lennon's birthday, which fascinated him. Um, he said to my dad, no, you're not sort of arsehole he's going to turn out to be. Um, it's funny, growing up as a kid, having a father like George Martin, you can't compare it to anything else. I've never actually swapped dads with anyone. Um, but we didn't necessarily, myself and my sister didn't actually grow up in a in a, in a terribly musical house, apart from, as a kid, I noticed my dad played the piano a lot, and odd people would come back and forth. In fact, when I was a playgroup, my, um, they went around the class, and I was about four or five, and they said, you know, what do your parents do for a living? And they, you know, you know, my dad's an accountant, my dad's a lawyer, my dad's a truck driver, whatever. And I said, my dad just sits at home and plays the piano. And it turns out he was writing, I think he was writing the music for Live and Let Die, the film at the time. And there's huge embarrassment amongst my parents. They go, you know, he's not employed, you know, he's got a proper job. And so it wasn't a sort of thing. I think that, I think growing up in, in, a, in a, it was, I didn't necessarily grow up in a musical household. It wasn't, you know, I had the privilege of meeting people like Paul McCartney at an early age and, and, and meeting, you know, the Beatles at an early age, but they were just friends of my parents. It didn't mean a whole lot to me as a kid. Um, I remember when I became interested in the guitar and became interested in songwriting, Paul did say to me, he was incredibly encouraging, he goes, that's great, you know, I find it difficult to write songs and I'm Paul McCartney. So I did have a privileged sort of background as far as that goes. My parents were always uh, very wary of me getting a proper job. They, I learned to play the guitar, as you can, some people might be able to see quite badly, but behind my parents' back, you know, it was a, it was a thing, you know, don't join the music industry. Um, I'm delighted I did. In fact, I really got involved in music because my dad started to lose his hearing when I was about 16 and he needed a second pair of ears and he didn't really want to tell people he was losing his hearing. So I became his ears to a certain extent. I'd come in and try and help him by through that I would learn off him. And we started working together. And it was actually a great thing because I was needed to a certain extent by him, which is nice as a son and a father working together. And at the same time, he was always very good. He never had a sort of, that's my boy kind of attitude. He was always very uh, receptive to my ideas. And in fact, he's been receptive to people's ideas throughout the whole of his career. And uh, he treated me no differently and was always open to, to my suggestions, however wrong they may be. And you know, God knows I made lots of wrong ones. So it gave me a chance to learn, it gave me a chance to respect him for what he does and what he's done. I, I never thought of, I was never any good um, at learning songs off by heart. I mean, you know, I bluff my way through most things. I've never been terribly accurate at playing anything. I can play a number of things very badly, but I was much more interested in playing for a reason. So as soon as I learned to play the guitar with a friend of mine, we started playing in the underground here, started playing in tube stations and playing whatever songs we could learn, basically, you know, as you do. And my parents were, my dad was especially distraught by this. He didn't want, you know, George Martin's son being arrested because it's illegal. At that stage, it was illegal to busk. In fact, the way we played it should have been illegal, but it was illegal to busk. And uh, I then got into playing bands. I formed a band, you know, as you do. And I had a great time, I think, playing in a band, learning to play an instrument. Learning to play a guitar was the best thing I ever did. And not that I practice the guitar or play it very often now, but it opens so many doors as far as if you're willing to play it to people, if you're willing to bore people with it. It's great, you know, to meet people and chat. It's like a, a great hobby to have. It's better than video games, for instance. And, and I think that being in a band taught me more about recording and music for enough than being the son of George Martin did. Because people, if you're the son of um, someone, people expect you have this knowledge, which generally you don't have. You know, people think you grew up in recording studios. And of course, I'd spent more time in studios than probably people, other people are 16, but it's still just a row of buttons. You know, if you're 16, it's still just, you know, a compressor, of course, I know what a compressor does. I hadn't got a clue for a long time because people expect you to know these things. But if you're in a band, you, especially as I was in an unsuccessful band, you have a chance to make a whole lot of mistakes and learn stuff. And the hardest thing, not that it's a bad thing, but the hardest thing if you're a son of some son of some famous or a child of a famous person is you don't get that many chance, chances to make mistakes before people go, people are hoping for the second coming, people are going, he's going to be just like his dad. And if you screw up, you're then the other way. You're then, he couldn't get a proper job. 
And so being in a sort of hidden band gave me a chance to learn. And that's what, you know, music is about evolving. It's about discovering new stuff. It's about learning new songs. It's about learning how things work. It's not about playing the same old things every day. Then things become boring. After playing in a band, I carried on playing in, I always played in, played with people, always like going on tour and playing in pubs and clubs. So I thought, thought, you know, it's just, it was just great fun. And I started writing jingles, I started writing commercials. Um, I started doing gasoline adverts, that was my, for, for France. French gasoline is, was the peak of my life. And that was when I was at university. And then when I left university, I wanted to become a record producer. I wanted to write music people and produce people, but I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't have any, you know, what do you do? You can't go, I'm the son of George Martin, let me produce you, you know, it's, or, or give me a job. And so I ended up working in press. And at the same time, I started looking at bands. And funny enough, my dad was sort of, he was nervous, I think, of me following in his footsteps at this stage. And I saw a band called My Life Story. They're playing at the, 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 My Life Story, they're playing at the, the Astoria in London. And I went to go see them play and I thought they were good and they were, had a whole lot of strings and I did an arrangement of them and produced them. And they released a single that became sort of number one in Melody Maker and Enemy and the Cool magazines. And someone showed it to my dad and said, look what your son's been up to. And I was just doing it in the evenings, you know, as you do if you're a fan of music and you want to get into music. And that kind of opened doors to me. I left the press job and became a producer. Pro production engineering is, is something that you learn stuff all the time with, like any sort of, sort of music. I mean, I think, for me, starting out and how I am now, if I can work in any form of music, I'm happy. It doesn't matter. It's just, you know, I think um, I produce more stuff now and remix and mix stuff now, probably because in a way it's what people expect of me and maybe I'm okay at it. The Love Project came from, it came from the fact that they needed to do a show. It was uh, George Harrison and Guy Le Liberté, who's the head of Cirque du Soleil, were friends. And they decided to do a show and they decided they couldn't have anyone singing Beatles songs a la Mamma Mia. They didn't want, you know, a chorus singing Hey Jude on stage. And I think that's the right decision. And so they approached my dad and I just had quite a lot of success in the UK doing classical stuff at the time. And Apple came to see me and I sat with my dad and talked to them about it. And I said to them, I could try doing, creating a gig that never happened. And Neil Aspinall, who was the head of Apple, said, you know, I'd love, you know, till we talked about, because he was their roadie, we talked about their shows. We talked about, you know, starting off with Long Tall Sally and finishing with Twist and Shout, or, you know, creating this thing. And I said, well, listen, with Pro Tools and digital stuff, I can perhaps create a gig that never happened. So under complete secrecy, uh, I went upstairs here into a very small room and took some material and I took the beginning, the, sorry, the, the drums from the end and get back because I realized they're the same tempo and because I thought I'd start a gig, never happened with a drum solo going into a song and started moving things around and you know, people said mashing up, I always thought it was a bit rude um, and then thought how am I going to start this and got the piano from a day in the life and turned that backwards because I thought if that makes a good ending it'll make a good beginning as it sucks into the chord from Hard Day's Night. I just had fun, you know, and my view was, you know, if I can impress my dad doing Beatles stuff then that's pretty good, you know, as a son you're always trying to impress your dad I think or, or compete in some way and it just so happened that it was on Beatles stuff and I was auditioning for the Beatles and I really thought that they probably wouldn't like it. You know, I, I really thought that people would think this is a really bad idea. It sounds like a bad idea if you just talk about it. And I then took Within You, Without You and Tomorrow Never Knows and stuck those together because I thought this will definitely get me fired, if nothing else. And they came and they really liked it. They liked the ideas. And so I ended up becoming um, the sort of... <laughs> you know, the sort of legacy which I kind of fought against for a long time, and here I am now in Abbey Road talking about it, um, suddenly became part of it. And uh, I backed up all the catalogue and the Pro Tools and started working on this, on this project, which, which became love. Um, I came with my dog Stan and went to my room and started working, you know, we had a list. I worked with the director of the show and my dad. My dad would come in sort of two days a week and I'd play him ideas and we'd work through stuff. So he was kind of producing me doing it. But the bosses were 
the Beatles, Ringo and Paul, and Olivia, Olivia Harrison and Yoko Ono, who were representing George and John. And it was important that they liked everything. They had to hear everything before it was passed on anywhere, anywhere else. And the interesting thing about the Beatles, it's such a protected circle, rightfully so, that if you do something and no one likes it, no one ever hears it. You know, and that's actually quite a good thing for me because it means I could take risks. You know, occasionally people at Abbey Road were sort of, you know, people who never hadn't heard anything, which the majority of people here didn't like the idea of what we were doing and didn't like the idea of me coming in and changing. People think it's changing history, but it's not because I'm not deleting anything. I wasn't, you know, I, I was just really trying to do something different. And Ringo and Paul would come in. The funny thing is they come and listen to stuff and they're not allowed to take stuff away either. It's not like you give them a CD. The only chance of them listening to the new mixes we were doing was by coming here and listening to them. And then later as we got the technology sorted out and secure drives were done, I would go and see Yoko and sit down with her and work through stuff. And it's fascinating. For me it was fascinating because I have no past with them. You know, I have no, I certainly wasn't there at the time. And so it's kind of on an even, I'm, I'm, I'm way down the pecking order, but it's kind of, I mean, on an even keel, as it were. There's no history, I have no, you know, experience of anything they did. So it was quite easy for me just to go, do you like it or you don't, what, you don't, what don't you like about it? And they were very proactive in it, um, all four of them, you know, the two wives and Ringo and Paul. And, you know, Paul was, Paul was the one that would give me the fear because he's such a good musician. I mean, Ringo is a pretty good musician as well, and they'd, they'd you know, they know their stuff and they know their own material and uh, occasionally in fact when we were doing the show I sat down with Paul I went through each bit and you know played in bits in the theatre and it was great it was a great evening and he goes you know he said to me you know I just I really I, I have to say I really like what you've done and you, what you've done has been sympathetic with my music and I really appreciate that for me that was just you know the best but when, we, when the show, when it came to the opening of the show, at the very beginning when people walk into the theatre and they're sitting down, I couldn't work out what, because they wanted Beatles music to play, and someone said, well, why don't you just do another 60 minutes of, and I mean, it took me two years to do the 90 minutes. So I decided to get as many Beatles on as I could by taking the vocals off, which is difficult with Beatles stuff, because there's so much leakage on the tracks, and just play the backing tracks. So it's like the Beatles are playing, they're backing as you walk in. So you have Dear Prudence with no vocal, you know, you have Should Know Better with no vocal, and Penny Lane with no vocal. And the idea was that it would counterpoint because when because starts, it's just vocals. So I'm sitting with Paul, and he's two, my dad's there, and Paul's there, and Penny Lane's playing in the in the ceiling of the theatre. And Paul goes, and what's this then? And I went, It's Penny Lane. He goes, I know it's bloody Penny Lane, but what is what's it doing in the ceiling? And I said, well, I just thought it would be an idea to, you know, because they listened to everything. I thought it would be an idea to maybe put the backing tracks up there. And he's like, oh, OK, you know, I'll have a listen. And it's right there because it is their music. And, you know, and my dad sometimes, you know, it's, he feels embarrassed because it's, it's not his music and it certainly isn't mine. It is there. It's, they were, there were four Beatles and it was their band and that was it. There's no fifth Beatle. With music, there's things you'd like to do. I, I wish I could play things better, you know. I've always thought, you know, it'd be great to, to really learn how to play the bass properly, or guitar properly, or piano properly, you know. Um, but uh, it's just a question of time. Maybe I'll start watching our video tunes and, and then become a better musician. But, you, you know, there's, I'd like to, you know, work with you know, a really good young band. At the same time, I'd love to go and do something like the Love Project with something else, you know, with taking, taking stuff and creating, make people listen to music again. The good thing about Love is it does, people do analyse and people do listen, and people don't have it on the background, they do actually get into it. And that's why we do music, we do music because we're passionate about it. And so, really, I mean, I, I'm about to write a television thing, I'm, you know, you just, it's a question of writing, producing and being creative and anything that lets you do that, you take. And every day, I just can't believe I, I can do this for a living. You know, I was told by my parents for years it's an impossible job to do for a living, despite coming from my background, because I think maybe when I have kids, I'll be doing the same thing, you know, don't go into music, you know. But it's just, it's, you do it because you love it. And, that's, and, and if you can get paid for it, it means you don't have to do another job to get in the way as well, so it's fantastic. I would say to anyone learning an instrument, anyone you know, struggling, because let's face it, we all struggle with instruments all the time, and we struggle with music. 
is that no matter how hard it is, it's hard for everyone. And that love that you have for it, never let go of it. Because you, know, you might be trying to learn a song and go, I'm never going to learn this. But the fact of it is, you do. You do learn and you do move on. And the thing to do is never ever give up. Never ever lose that drive and that, that feeling you get when you work something out or you hear some great music. Because it's much better than sitting down and watching the telly. I mean, the thing about, the thing about music is that I think if anyone's toured, I used to tour a lot, you know, you end up kind of working on automa automatic pilot. And, uh, and you get, you start amusing yourself with stuff. I was playing bass in a band, and you start playing the same things over and over again. And, and uh, I was once in Germany, and I used to jump off the stage. And, and I jumped off the stage, and I had no idea until I left the theater, how far I was jumping. We played the end of the concert, and I jumped off the stage, and there was no crowd there. I mean, let's face it, it wasn't that popular, but there was, there was a break before the people. And I launched off the stage, and seeing the band's faces, and they looked at me, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die in a, in a shit club in Germany. And I dropped about 12 feet. My bass amp almost followed me, because I you know, didn't have wireless or anything. I just, the bass, <laughs> it was like Wile E. Coyote. The, my lead unraveled. <laughs> it's the only thing that kept me alive. And an Ampeg SV200 over there called, came, came crashing out afterwards. But yeah, I spent most of my time being laughed at by people. You know, I think it's important. I think it's important in studios to have a good laugh. It's funny, I mean, you know, it's, you know, the Beatles, it's one thing, that was, one thing that was shocking for me from listening to all of the tapes, everything they did, was not you know, how serious it was. It was how much kind of fun there is in the tapes. Even when you think, oh, the White Album, they didn't get on. They're really cracking up most of the time. And it's kind of, you forget that actually they came to the studio to have a good time. And all the other stuff you read about happened in offices and accountants and all that sort of stuff. Most of the studio stuff is great. And that's the thing about music. Music should be fun. You know, if you're learning music, have a laugh with it. And don't sit on your own and do it. You know, find someone to play with. Because... Uh, the great thing about music is there's always someone worse than you. you can, I mean, in my case, you really have to hunt them out. But, you know, there is. And so show off to someone. Well, the, I mean, the great thing about the internet is the fact you can, you can delve into the world of songs and work out chords. And one of the problems I struggle from is you look on the internet, and quite often the, the chord sheets are wrong. And there's some guy going, if you know the right way this song goes, please write in. You think, oh, that's no good. I can work that out. And the great thing about iVideo tunes is it breaks down that barrier and you've suddenly been taught by professionals. You've suddenly been taught in a simple way by professionals. It's kind of inspired me. You know, I saw iVideo tunes before, before I got involved in it. And it's inspired me to like going, right, I'm going to see if I can learn the piano better now. You know, and I think that's a great thing. You know, people don't have access to the best people in the world. And now, with iVideo tunes, they do. You can be taught by some of the best people, you know, from home. And the way it's shot and the way it's done is very simple. You know, if I can understand it, it's very simple. So I think it's a great thing. It's a great learning tool for people. And, uh, and I think hopefully it'll, be, it'll create great musicians in the future. Giles Martin. I'm here at Abbey Road Studios to talk about Come Together. Come Together was recorded in July 1969 as part of the Abbey Road Sessions, the last, the last album the Beatles made. Um, and it was a time, it was a time for enough for coming together for the Beatles because they'd been knocked apart by Let It Be, the Let It Be Sessions. And they wanted to record one last album. It's well known they wanted to record a last album using the same team. My, my, my dad had kind of uh, not left during Let It Be, but Let It Be finished without being finished, if that makes sense. And Jeff Emmerich had walked out, and he came back for Abbey Road, the album. And Come Together was an, came from an interesting time because John Lennon had been injured in a car crash with Yoko in Scotland. And this is the story about when he, he brought her bed into the studio. In fact, I think it was just by the stairs over there that, that she lay 
while they were recording the album for a certain period of time. He was concerned about her and, and, uh, and he was not that interested in the time in the making of the record. And then suddenly Come Together happened. And the way it worked is John had a kind of blues idea. He had, a, he had an idea for, you know, you know, he was in, you know, Screaming Jay Hawkins, all these sort of things. He was, that's what he was into. Dr. John he'd heard, and you know, he was a young man. But it was that kind of thing. And Come Together was meant to be like that. And they worked on it. And Paul, Paul came up with his bass riff, you know, the, the famous you know, sliding bass riff, which, which we'll come to later. And the band played it in the studio, and they played it, they played it really as a, as a, as a three-piece with John singing. He clapped, not to begin with, on the second verse of the take they chose, he started doing it in the, sec you know, in the second verse to begin with. He, there was no introduction. It was just an introduction with bass and guitar. The song evolved as they played it, and it was Paul on bass, Ringo on drums, George on guitar, and John in a box, in a, in a booth made in the studio, singing. Um, the, fir the first vocal take, fun enough, is, is, is very different uh, from, from how, it, how it ends up on record. It's funny, a lot of people have read criticism saying it's, uh, it's raw, it's so great. And I, and I think it's kind of like, I think John, from what I, could, from what I can hear, knew it was going to be a guide. He liked, to work on, he liked to work on his material as it went along. He liked to work on develop ideas. Lucy in the Sky with Dimes, he changed the melody as, as he recorded the song. So I think he, it was a, almost a throwaway. He knew he'd come back and redo it. I mean, he sang during the, during the guitar solo. He just scattered it in, on the take. So it evolved as a band playing really, really well. And John almost singing a guide of how he thought the song should sound with his vocal. And actually, it's the, the vocal performance is much angrier than what you hear. It's much kind of more rock and roll, more raw. And when we came, I came to doing Come Together for, for, the, for Love, the project, the project I did. Uh, and it's the strongest memory I have, Come Together. Come Together didn't have many changes to it as far as I was asked to change things. But when Ringo and Paul came to listen to the, the 5.1 mix, they sat there and it was the best experience because they both looked and they both went, you know, I remember this day. I remember how good we were on this day. Because as a song, you can't explain musically how the song works because it's to do with individual performances. It's to do with the fact they played so well together. And they made such a, a great noise and come together as a feel. It's not so much, you can give a bunch of us all the parts and we'd ruin it. It's the band playing really, really well as a unit and kind of establishing the fact they've been together for so long. And that's what the two of them, when they sat and listened to, remembered. And just remembered all the politics went, went by the side, all of the, the, the fraught nature of the whole year they had before. And it was just a band playing, doing what they do really well. So after this live performance was done, they had three tracks, which were transferred. I was recorded on a four track, and these three tracks were recorded onto an eight track tape. And the three tracks were Ringo's drums, Paul's bass, and George's guitar. On top of that, John then did his vocal, and the vocal is, of course, you know, pretty much one take. Um, and he recorded it with, as John did, with the, with, with the tape echo on the tape. There's no, every, all the effects are there on tape. And he, he liked the effect of having a heavy tape delay and clapping and saying, shoot me at the same time. And, you know, ironically, I suppose, that, that you, you had him going, shoot me like that. That's the sound of Come Together. And everyone thinks, shh. But he's actually, that's what he's saying. And it's just the fact that me is being hidden by the, by the bass line. On top of which, Paul then played electric piano. And it's actually a great piano solo. It's funny, it, he's, uh, um, you know, as Ringo says, Paul has a great left hand. And there's a great walking bass line on the piano solo. You know, which I, I, I thought was Billy Preston, but of course he wasn't around. It was, it's, it's Paul playing. He's incredibly accomplished. And then it's John playing the guitar solo, which is a twin track guitar solo um, after, the keyboard, after the keyboard solo. And the track was built up, and it's just very simple. Paul overlaid a backing vocal, and there, there's your eight tracks. Um, it was just the foundation was so good. 
very little needs to be, do needed to be done. You know, they, they recorded their, their, their main track and they added a keyboard, a guitar solo and a vocal to it. And there you have it, that's come together. Come Together is, 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 is famed for, its, uh, for Paul's bass line. He, he played f some fantastic bass lines, a lot, of, uh, you know, really a lot on, on John and George songs. If you take Something or Tax Man, I mean, just incredible bass lines. And Come Together is, is no exception. And it's based, around a, it's based around D, the blues of D. Based around a hammer on. Going up to an F. And that's the, that's the main riff that starts the song, which is... Once the, once the song starts, I think he stops, he stops hammering on. He's started going... And that happens for the, for the whole song, so it's... In D... to an A, stop on the G, and back in again with the hammer on. And I think he may be sliding occasionally, and the slide would be, if I can play it, would be um, again, simplified whenever they're singing to this. And, and the choruses are just going down from B to a G. To an A, and back in again. So that's the bass line, rough bass line to come together. Um, and it's, 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 it's so much part of the song, and it's so simple. But, you know, that said, the drums are pretty cool as well. The tone for Come Together is real simple. You're just going to use a electric semi-hollow guitar, or you could use just an electric solid body guitar. Um, with the bridge pickup, um, preferably a bridge humbucking pickup, uh, cranked up, and then the amp is really just going to be a tuba amp with a bit of distortion on it. Not too much, but enough that it really sounds somewhat grungy. And when you're plugged into a larger tube amp, it's really easy to kind of, especially with a, with a hollow body guitar, a semi-hollow body guitar, to get overwhelmed with the bass, of the bass sound and it kind of feeds back a lot. So I've got the bass rolled down a little bit and the mid-range and the treble up a bit. Um, of course, you don't want to take the bass out of the sound entirely, but it's important that you don't uh, get a lot of feedback in the sound. So. You can hear how that's breaking up just enough to sound like rock and roll. It's, it's not uh, really a high distortion setting, but it's definitely not clean either. So that's the tone for Come Together. This is Come Together by the Beatles. This song is in the key of D and standard tuning. And the intro is really just the, the main riff of the song, the main guitar riff, played four times. And it interacts with the bass and the keyboard. I'm going to just play it in time and then explain it slowly. So that starts with the first finger at the 10th fret of the 6th string, the 3rd finger on the 12th fret of the 5th string, and the 4th finger on the 12th fret of the 4th string. So we're just a D, the bottom part of a D chord. And you're just going to play it twice, palm muted, and then hammer on from the 10th fret on the 5th string to the 12th fret of the 5th string, and then play the 10th fret on the 4th uh, string. So it's just... And 
And that's the intro for Come Together. Here come old flat top, here come grooving up slowly, he got juju up all he won. The verses are eight measures long, and you're just playing a simple riff on the fifth and sixth string. And the first chord in the verse is D, so it's actually going to be four measures of D. Your first finger is going to be at the 10th fret of the uh, sixth string, third finger at the 12th fret of the uh, fifth string, and you're just strumming eighth notes and downstrokes with palm meeting, and you're going to uh, add the fourth finger on the 14th fret of the fifth string like this. It'll sound two. And that is just simply two strums on the 10th and 12th fret, two strums on the 10th and 14th fret. And you're just alternating that. So it's just one and two and three and four and. And you can see how I'm kind of lifting the pressure off of the left hand as I play that to make sure it sounds muted. I'm also muting with the right hand as well. A little bit of muting there too, but you want to make sure you don't get that sound. So four measures of that, uh, one measure being one and two and three and four and. Um, you can play four measures of D down to the fifth fret and the seventh fret. Same exact riff. So your fourth finger is going to stretch out to the ninth fret. This would be the A chord. So this would be two measures of this. One and two and three and four and one. And then sliding down to a G chord at the third fret and fifth fret. And you're just going to stop on one on that. So again from the A chord, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one. And you can see on that four and uh, immediately preceding the G chord, I lift the, the uh, fourth finger off four and one to get into that G chord. So the entire verse will sound like this. And that's the verse for Come Together. Come together right now over me. The choruses are just two measures long. I'm going to play it in time and then explain it. So that starts with a B power chord in second position. My first finger is on the second fret of the fifth string. My third finger is on the fourth fret of the fourth string. And my third finger is on the fourth fret of the third string. So the strumming um, kind of opens up a little bit less palm meeting. So you, get... and you can see how I'm lifting the first finger on beat four there off of the fifth string. So I get the A open underneath the B power chord. So it's one, two, and three, and four, and. And then down to a G power chord. Stopping on three into an A power chord. So that's G power chord, the third uh, fret on the sixth string, and the fifth fret on both the fourth and the fifth string. Sliding into the A power chord, two frets higher. So it's just like this B, A, G, A. And that's the chorus for Come Together. The guitar solo in the middle of the song during the instrumental section is actually harmonized. I'm going to play the higher of the two parts in time and then explain it, then I'll play the lower. So here's the higher part. So that's pretty simple. I'm just bending the 15th fret on the first string up a whole step, and twice more. Releasing down to the 15th fret, down to the 13th fret of the first string, and then bending the 15th fret on the first string back up again. So that whole first phrase. The second phrase is identical, except this, the very last bend you're going to do on the second string of the 15th fret. So it goes. And the third phrase, or the last phrase, is just going to be the second string at the 15th fret bent up a whole step twice, brought back down to the 15th fret, and then you're going to play the 14th fret on the 2nd string, and then bend the 15th fret up on the 1st string. So you get... So that's the uh, higher of the two leads. The harmony underneath that will sound like this.
So that starts uh, in a similar way on the second string, 15th fret up a whole step, down to the 13th fret of the second string, and bending the 15th fret up a whole step again. And uh, that is exactly the same phrase that we had on the first string, by the way, just a string below it on the second string. The second phrase starts the same way, but ends with a bend from the 12th fret on the third string. So it goes. And then the very last phrase is just a bend from the 12th fret on the third string up twice, brought down to the 10th fret on the third string, and it actually doesn't have the very, la the very last note that's in the uh, first guitar solo, or the higher of the two. Uh, it, it ends on one last bend. This one actually just lays out during that last bend. So that's the middle guitar solo, or instrumental section of Come Together. I'm going to play the outro guitar solo in time and then slow it down for you. So as you can hear, that is basically uh, some fairly simple blues phrases. Every two measures they come in. And the first one starts uh, out of the basic D pentatonic minor scale. At the 13th fret on the second string, you're going to bend up a whole step slowly. And then bend the 13th fret on the first string twice, up a whole step and bring it back down. Pull off to the 10th fret of the first string and then bend the 13th fret on the second string up a whole step. So you get that. So you could bend that with the third finger or the fourth finger. The next phrase starts with the tenth fret on the third string, and then a release bend from the twelfth fret, uh, bent up a whole step. You pick it after you bend it, so you only hear it release. Pulled off to the tenth fret on the third string, and then a bend from the thirteenth fret on the second string up a whole step. So you get. And the next phrase is similar, uh, starting on the first string at the 10th fret, and then a release bend from the 13th fret, bent up a whole step, pull it off to the 10th fret, and then the 13th fret up a whole step on the second string. So you get. And then the 10th fret on the second string, a release bend from the 13th fret on the second string, pull it off to the 10th fret on the second string, and then the 15th fret on the first string, bent up a whole step. So you get. Uh, the next phrase is just a bend from the 15th fret on the first string up a whole step twice, release, pulled up to the 13th fret, and then bent back up from the 15th fret. So good. After that, you're going to move up to the 17th position between the 17th and 20th fret, picking the 17th fret on the first string, and then doing a release bend from the 20th fret, uh, bent up a whole step, pulled up to the 17th fret, and then a bend from the 20th fret up a whole step on the first string. So you get. And then you repeat that phrase for the next one. So you get. Then it's back down to the 13th fret on the first string. Release bend from the 15th fret to the 13th fret, bent up from the 15th fret on the first string up a whole step. And then down to the 10th fret on the third string. Release bend from the 12th fret up a whole step on the third string. Pulled up to the 10th fret, and then the 13th fret on the 2nd string up a whole step. So you get. 
And then uh, the last couple phrases, you're just going to bend the 13th fret on the first string up a whole step. Twice, release it, pull off to the 10th fret, and bend the 13th fret on the second string up a whole step. So you get... And that's the outro guitar solo for Come Together. This is the performance of Come Together. Over me.